Crossroads family, why don't you stand with me this morning? This is the day our Lord has made. Amen? Amen. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Our God is alive. Amen? Sought us out, sent his son, abandoned his, his glory and his throne, his riches, to come down and take the most shameful punishment possible, also that we could have a chance to live in his grace. Amen? It's exciting. Our God is alive. Let's sing this morning.
morning, Crossroads. Good morning, good morning. Give the Lord some praise in this house today. Man, it is exciting to be in the house of the Lord. As Pastor Zach said, today is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. I'm excited that you chose to worship with us today. If you're watching online, we want to encourage you to hit the share button, share this with your friends, your family, and just share it with the world because they need to hear the message of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us go to the Lord in prayer as we continue to worship. Dear Heavenly Father, help us, Lord. Help us to put aside the distractions, everything that's going on in our lives. Make us strong in our weakness. Father God, we come to you today with, with no agenda. We just want to worship you. We thank you, Lord. We love you. We praise your name. We are excited to be in your house. Everyone said together, amen. There was a day we held on breath and felt the sting of bitter death and all our hopes were buried in the grave. Our eyes were weighed, our hearts were torn between our faith and what we knew before our King.
Amen. Amen. Shall we pray? Our Father, we bless you. Yes, we will continue to sing out hallelujah for the great work you have done for us on the cross of Calvary. We thank you for this hope for every one of us. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, a day you have made and will be rejoicing and be glad in it in the name of Jesus. We thank you that we are able to come before your presence. We don't take it for granted. It is, it is a privilege, oh God, and we are grateful. We say thank you. Thank you for everyone that is gathered here and even those online. Our Father, we want to bless you for, for the love you have for us that is unconditional. We want to thank you for every soul that is here. Lord, it's not going to be like any other Sunday that we hear as a return. Come and gather before you. But Father, everyone will not go back the same because we'll connect and Lord, you touch every one of us at the point of our needs in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, continue to go along with us. Father, we need your presence with us. Father, we want to connect deeply with you. Father, we want to be rooted in you, O oh God. Father, we just want to be religious, O oh God. Just come in as activity. But Father, we want the Holy Spirit, O oh God, to overtake every one of us in the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, Father, revive us, O oh God. Help us to put our eyes and fix our eyes on you, Jesus. Help us to have the mind of Christ in you, in us, O oh God. Clot us all with the garment of humility. Above it all, Father, we pray that you grant us the hunger and the thirst after you, that daily, every day, we will continue to grow and be rooted in you. Thank you because you be with us. We want to lift up your servant as he comes to bring the word. Lord, he will utter and declare as a servant of God. Father, you grant him utterance from above. Father, he will speak as an oracle of God. Lord, our whatever will proceed out of his mouth will come directly from the throne of grace and it will not return to you void. As many that are here that are not saved, Lord, we pray that, Lord, let today be a day of salvation. Let there be healing today in the name of Jesus. We bless you, Lord. We honor you. Be thou exalted, be thou magnified. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I want to take this opportunity to please ask us that as many as are led by the Spirit is for everyone. Come join us in the upper room prayer ministry. We are there to just intercede for the church and pray along for our members and just be there to just stand in the gap. We meet at 8.15 in the gym and 8.15 to 8.45. Then the second session is 10.15 to 10.45. May the Lord bless you as you consider, consider to join us to worship together in Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen, amen. You guys may be seated. We're going to have an announcement video for you. There's a lot going on here at Crossroads Community Church. I want to encourage you to get involved, get plugged in, get connected. That's how real growth happens. Amen? Raise a hallelujah. Hey, Crossroads. I wanted to share a conversation I had with somebody just uh, the other day. It's a conversation that's come up a few different times, and it's about somebody's experience at a different church. And uh, this particular person, when they were in leadership, they were trying to, uh, to serve in a particular way. And over something very small, they were really heavily criticized and, uh, and made to feel like they had done it wrong. And, uh, and they were young in their faith, and it made them feel judged, it made them feel criticized. And, and so that's something that we don't want to do. Our, our main objective is we want to love people. We want them to know that they're loved by God. We want to care for them any way that we can. And so that's why our mission statement is loving people into a loving relationship with Jesus Christ. And so our objective is, is to love Christ, but always be loving better. First Corinthians 13, love is patient, it's kind, it's not easily offended, it's not easily angered. We want to live into that as much as possible. So I just wanted to mention that to you as Crossroads. We do a great job at it, but it's something we always want to stay on top of, continuing to make Crossroads a place where life changes because they sense the love of God. So love people into a loving relationship with Jesus Christ. God bless you. Good morning. Here at Crossroads, we worship passionately, serve others, and share truth. One way that you can serve others 
is to volunteer at Church Under the Bridge. This is where we get a team of volunteers to go out to Church Under the Bridge, prepare and serve meals to the homeless community of San Antonio. It is a, an amazing a ministry that is out there. And if you would like to, to help, please sign up on the Church Center app today. It is an amazing opportunity for you to show the love of Jesus to our homeless community of San Antonio. Ladies and men, we have some awesome events coming up for you. Firstly, on April 30th, Guys Night Out is happening with games, some good food, and fellowship with your fellow men. So if you would like more information or you'd like to sign up, please go to the Church Center app to do so. Ladies, we are going to have a picnic sponsored by uh, the Women's Ministry. So if you are interested in that, please invite all your friends and sign up today on the Church Center app. Thank you. Today I want to talk to you about the growth track. It's a four-step process that's designed to help you go from your very first time here at Crossroads to walking into being a disciple maker, following Jesus with all your heart and bringing others along with you. Today, right after the service, even if you don't didn't sign up, we want you to stay for the welcome experience. That's step number one. It is just to get to know the church a little bit more about what we believe in and uh, the ministries you can get involved in and what it looks like moving forward. And then coming up May 16th, you can sign up for the transformation class, okay? And that's step number two right here, the transformation class. It's help, helping you reframe your thinking. When you become a Christian, you gotta start seeing the world the way Jesus does. Romans tells us that we have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, which sounds easy to say, but how do you actually do it? This class wants to break it down into some easy steps for you and help you walk through that. Starting today, you can go into the Church Center app and go to the Groups tab and start signing up for Lifelines. Lifelines is the third step in the process. We have a goal to have everybody here at Crossroads involved in a Lifeline, which is a small group where you get to know people intimately, grow together, create friendships, and chase after Jesus together. We truly believe so much growth happens in these groups, so you can start browsing those today and select one and sign up today. Also, May 19th, the last step, the lay ministry class, is starting May 19th. That is an in-depth class. It's 10 weeks long. It is a commitment, but it's to help you discover how God has equipped you for ministry. See, all of us have been called into ministry in some form or facet, and we want to help you discover what that is. And so we want to take you through that class. And so sign up today, and then how do you keep track of all this stuff? And so much, download the Church Center app. Okay, download the Church Center app, go to follow the easy steps, and you can find all these things in one convenient place and sign up today. Hey, Crossroads, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, the Bible says that God has given you the ability to produce wealth in order to confirm his covenant. Remember, a covenant is a two-way promise, so he has given you the ability to produce wealth so that you can go out and earn a living so that you can give to him, and as you give to him, then that starts a cycle where he gives back to you. That's why the Bible says, give and it should be given unto you. And so Jesus also said it is more blessed to give than to receive because when you give, it releases the giving of God. So I just want to remind you that you give to the church in many different ways, from the app to the website. We have the boxes in the hallways here. Uh, and remember, whatever you do, just give. If it's 50 cents, if it's 5 cents, we don't care. Just begin to give, and the Lord will begin to help you then and bless you over time. God bless you. Thank you guys for being here today with us. So as Pastor Lee mentioned in the video, our mission is to love others into a loving relationship with Jesus Christ. And one of the ways we do that is by serving others. So I'm excited to tell you that we're going to put that into practice. And one thing we're going to do to serve others and to serve other people in our community is to host our first annual school supply drive. So we're excited about that. It's going to take place on August 7th. And that seems so far away. I know August 7th seems several months away, and it is. But it'll be here before you guys know it, and more details will come out throughout the summer but one of the things that you can do today to get involved today is to help us reach our goal our goal is 500 bags our goal is to fill 500 backpacks serve 500 different families 500 different kids in our community when that day comes so some of the ways you can get involved today is by bringing pencils bringing crayons that's something that we're collecting and we started collecting already we have a school bus outside in the foyer where you can drop off your items just yesterday i went to the dollar tree and i bought several 
pencil just for a dollar. You know, everything at the Dollar Tree is a dollar. And they had plenty of pencils, plenty of crayons, and other supplies that you guys can pick up throughout the week and drop off here on Sunday. Or during the week, if you're in the area and you want to drop it off, you can drop it off as well. Um, another way you can is just to give. Maybe it's easier for you just to give, to contribute towards that. Um, you can fill out an envelope in front of you, write school supply drive. You can give on the Church Center app. It's one of the drop downs, one of the selections you can choose from. Um, another way you can do is just a text to give. It's something that we have where to make it, make it very easy for you to give. You can text the dollar amount you want to give um, and the word school to the number 84321, and it'll go directly towards that. And it's $25, $25 to fill one backpack and to bless one family in our community with school supplies. So we thank you in advance for your support. We thank you for your prayer for this event. And just know that what we're trying to do is to put into practice what we're saying, which is to serve others and serve not just people in this building, not just our kids and our students, but also the kids in our community who may need this blessing come August. Okay? So thank you so much for that. And with that, please um, go ahead and um, turn your attention to the screen where we have a powerful, powerful testimony to share with you guys. Crossroads, I am excited to be with you today. I get to share my testimony. I, I feel like I have an amazing testimony and that it's one that needs to be shared. And in the book of Psalms, it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. And, and that's where I was. And my valley was a diagnosis of cancer that came in October of 2019. Now, when the doctor gave me, gave me that, I was... I was not concerned. I was not worried because I knew walking into that office that day that my God had the victory. I didn't know what the doctor was going to tell me, but I knew before the doctor ever said anything that we had won the war. I had to go through the battle, but we had won the war. And I had an amazing comfort that was with me. In the book of John, Jesus says, I won't be with you forever, but I leave you with my peace. My peace I give you. He's talking about the peace of the Holy Spirit. And before I walked in, he gave me that peace. He empowered me to, to endure that valley. He let me know that he was with me the whole way and he comforted me. He gave me the strength to overcome. And so today I can stand here and tell you, I am cancer free. I am in full remission. And I, I made that journey in full peace. Hi, so I'm Alicia Corliss. Um, I'm gonna give the, the other half of the Brian side. When, when Brian got diagnosed, it was a shocker to me. He was going for a doctor's appointment and I said, hey, by the way, have the doctor look at your throat, you know, kind of offhand. Um, we have three kids. We have a very, very busy life. And that was one of those weeks where we didn't talk that week. You know, a text here and there, hi, I love you, I'm out. You know, nice to see you as we pass through. And it was a, a few days. He already knew and I didn't even know what's going on. So for me, one of the biggest takeaways I got from this experience was not to let the busyness of life take over. That's truly from the devil. Pastor says it all the time. Um, and I just thought that's, that's just our life. We have kids, we have work, we have, you know, go, go, go. But there's an importance to being still and to being with the people that you're around, with the people that you love. Um, the other side of that was, you know, Brian from the get-go was, you know, God's got this, you know, and, and I, I, I get that, I do, but when it's your heart, your loved one, you know, your other half, there's a whole different perspective on it too. So for me, it was, God, remind me that you have this, remind me that you have this. Every time I would get worried, I'd say, okay, God, I know you have this. Um, and in the end, God truly did have it. It, while it was hard, hard in different ways, God had it the whole time, and it did end up being something that was a, a hard thing that God made beautiful. Um, so, I hope this touches somebody. Amen. Amen. That's a fantastic testimony, and we're glad that Brian is cancer-free. Amen. God still does miracles, doesn't he? He still does miracles. And thank you, Sarah, for telling us about the school supply. I didn't know that everything at the dollar store was a dollar. I didn't, 
you know, everything I buy is at Walmart. Now I'm thinking I'm overspending, you know. So I'm going to have to rethink my whole, you know, consumer mindset. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Y'all think I'm cheap, don't you? <laughs> I am. I'm cheap. I'm cheap. Anyway, that's not what we're here to talk about. I want to. I want to continue this series called Elevate. Uh, the resurrection of Christ is real. It's just as real today as it was then. It is intended that it would change us today. When we take communion, we remember. Everybody say remember. And I want you to look at it as, as the word re-member. It's me moving back into membership with the body of Christ. I'm remembering. And when we remember Christ, we remember him on two different levels. We remember him historically, what he did. He came, he was born, he lived, he died, he rose again. And we remember that. But remembering, I remember that with the same knowledge that by his Holy Spirit, he is still physically transcendently with me today. Even today as we were worshiping, I sensed physically in my physical body the transcendent presence of God. And, and so when we remember him, we, we are remembering what he did historically, but I remember him, I join him again in that remembrance. And a big part of that is, is understanding how I remember the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it is intended that it have an impact on me now transcendently in a spiritual way, not just something I remember that happened, not just something that I read about, but something that affects me today. And this whole series that I'm talking about, Elevate, is that the power of the resurrection, the same power that lifted Jesus physically up from the dead spiritually, because now he's in his glorified body up from the dead, wants uh, that same spirit has been made available to us because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? So now we can live a life on a higher dimension. And I don't, I don't say this like we need to be arrogant or anything else. What I'm saying is that God is calling us to a higher place. He is calling us to a higher living, a higher lifestyle. It is where he wants to elevate your mind. The Bible says he's given you the mind of Christ. Just let that sink in for a minute. The mind of Christ. He wants to elevate the way you think, which changes how you feel, which changes how you behave, which changes your decisions, which changes your atmosphere, changes your relationships, changes everything. And in all of it, he is trying to elevate you to a higher dimension so that your life has a peace that transcends understanding. Amen. And a joy that is so great, you don't even know how to describe it. And, and a love that endures through everything. And so no matter what you're going through, you are able to keep loving. And at the same time, you are still experience the love of God no matter what you're going through. And so this is what I'm talking about, being elevated. And it's the power that is released through the resurrection. And so that's what I want to continue talking about today. And before I really get into it, I want to go through one scripture that it many times gets lost in the resurrection in Matthew 27, verse 50. We spend so much time talking about the resurrection of Christ that sometimes we, we glaze over this. And in verse 50, it says, and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. So he died. He's on the cross and he, he dies. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, it's talking about the Holy of Holies, and we've talked about that many times. But behind this curtain is where the Spirit of God was manifested in his fullness. And only one man, one time of the year during, on the Day of Atonement could go into the presence of God. So when Christ died, the curtain was torn. Now, the curtain was 30 feet high. It was 20 feet long. And it was, some, some say, as, as thick as two feet so it wasn't a couple of men down at the bottom tearing it. It says it was torn from top to bottom. In other words, God tore it open so that we can now enter in. So not just one man, but anyone can go into the fullness of God in his presence at any time. Amen? And this happened because of the death of Christ. And so we see that happening. It says the earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. Did y'all hear that part? And the tombs broke open. Not one, many. The tombs, not the tomb of Christ, the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. 
I want you to see that the power of Christ's death and resurrection went out beyond him into the tombs of other people so that on the third day when he rose again, all these other people started walking into the city who had been dead. When you learn how to operate in the power of the resurrection, it not only affects you, but it goes out beyond you to your husband, to your wife, to your kids, to your grandkids, and it raises them up out of the spirit of death. So whatever it's got them down, whatever it's holding them back, what is happening inside of you begins to change who they are, and it changes everything. So my question is, do you have a child who needs to be broke free from the spirit of death? Do you have a spouse that needs to come up out of the tomb? Do you have a grandmother? Do you have a grandchild? Do you, do you have somebody in your life that the enemy's got a hold on and they are stuck in the pleasures of the flesh? They are stuck in the sickness of sin. They are stuck in depression, anger, bitterness, whatever it is. If you want to see them broken open, if you want to see them come out of that, be set free from that, then you need to learn how to live in the resurrection. And when you live in that resurrection power, it changes everything. Amen? It changes everything. And so that's what we're talking about. And so remember this whole series, we're taking a, a cue from Christ when he predicts his death and his resurrection by referring to himself as the temple and comparing himself to the temple that was destroyed and then raised, raised up again. He said, if you destroy this temple, talking about himself, then in three days I will raise it up again. And so he has given us a cue to understand this resurrection power. It's all about the temple being torn down and raised back up. And so we have been spending our time in Zechariah. And in Zechariah, we, we begin to see how God is speaking to the people of Israel through the prophet of Zechariah. And what it happened is Babylon had come in. The king had come in. He had destroyed the temple. The temple had been destroyed for 70 years. 70 years. Now, this is the heart of Jerusalem, the heart of Israel. This is where they commune with God. So communion had been broken to a large degree for 70 years. You ever feel distant from God? Ever go through those long times where you just feel like you just can't connect? Those long periods of sadness, long periods of misery. And, and so God, in a, in a way, he, he began to start this and, and he allowed them to start rebuilding. And when they started trying to get things right, you, you know, whenever you're going through a hard time and, and you get away from God and different things and, and you start to pull away, you start to fade away, whatever you want to call it. And, and then you start thinking, yourself, you know, I got to get back on track. I got to rebuild this thing. I got to get back to where I need to be. And as soon as you start doing that, all hell breaks loose. And that's what happened to them. They started building it, and they, and, and they started going. And all of a sudden, the people that, thought, that they thought would want to help them actually hindered them, didn't want to see it built. People were jealous. People were angry. You know, some people like it when you're down. Some people like it when you can't get up because it makes them feel better about themselves. It makes them feel better about their life, and they're not there to help you, and they like to see it. But God says, I want to lift you up out of it. No matter what has happened, no matter what somebody has done, I want to resurrect you. You. And so he spoke to the prophet Zechariah to Zerubbabel and said, y'all need to start building again. It, it has been 16 years. So you had 70 years where it, where it just sat there. Then they started trying to get it again. Then everything fell apart. Everything fell apart. You start trying to do things right and all of a sudden your friends start dropping off on you. You lose your job. You get a bad diagnosis, all this kind of stuff. Trying to keep you because the devil knows if he can get you when you first start, it's easier than after you get the momentum rolling. Amen? And so he's trying to catch you before you gain any strength, before you really get the, the, the thing rolling a little bit. And, and so what's happened, it laid dormant for 16 years, and then God spoke to the prophet Zechariah, to Zerubbabel, and said, it's time to get it going again. Amen? It's time to raise it up again. And here's what he said. He said, you're not going to do it by might. You're not going to do it by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Amen? So many times when we're trying to get our life right, we're doing it by our own power. We're trying to do it the way we want to do it, through our own methodology, through our own communication, through our own manipulation, through our own emotions, and we're trying to force things to be a certain way, and we're trying to wheel ourselves into it. And what God was trying to say to the Israelites when all hell broke loose is you can't do it on your own. You need me. Amen. And so when, whenever you come in here today and if, if you're in that place and, and you're trying to get things right, you're trying to get back on track and everything's falling apart and the enemy's coming against you, just know this, that God is with you. 
and he's going to help you. And, and, and he says, do not despise small beginning. He said, if I started it, I'm going to finish it. And so if God has helped you to get back to where you were, then he's going to help you keep on going. And he's going to bring you to where you need to be. Amen. And he's going to restore. He's going to renew. He's going to refresh. And you're going to find yourself in a better place. You just got to hold on for a little while. Amen. Can you hold on for a little while? Amen. Are y'all awake this morning? Anybody? Now, let me, let me get into the scripture here in Zechariah. Let's read this. And, and I want to focus today on this vision. I want to focus on the vision today. In Zechariah chapter 4, verse 1. Then the angel who talked with me returned and woke me up like someone awakened from sleep. He asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it with seven channels to the seven lamps. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? He answered, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I replied. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by mind, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Amen. Now, if you remember last week, we talked about how does the spirit work? If it's not by might, how does it work? When you allow God to begin to change your heart, then it has a moving in other people's heart. And just like people are raised up from the dead because of what's happening in you, when you begin to get into the spirit and live by the spirit, then God begins to pour favor down upon you and he begins to promote you and he gets you in position. He gives you influence with other people and people's hearts are changed. And he changed the heart of Cyrus and he changed the heart of the king and he changed the hearts of the enemies of God. And they came back and they actually began to say, uh, everybody needs to worship the God of Daniel. Everybody needs to worship the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And everything was changed. And when God begins to change hearts, then he will provide for you. He will protect you. And he will give you everything that he has promised to give you. Amen. But it's not because I go and force it, but it's because I get right in tears within my own spirit, I get in the spirit, and as I live by the spirit, then it begins to have influence over other hearts and minds, and it changes everything, and that's how God moves. Amen? Are y'all with me? And so what we talked about last week is I got to learn how to get into the spirit. Remember, if you live by the spirit, the fruits of the spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Amen? So I need to learn how to operate. It doesn't mean I always feel it, but I got to learn how to do it. I may not feel like loving you in the moment, but I'm going to anyway. I may not feel like being patient, but I'm going to be patient anyway. I may not feel like having joy, but I'm going to say this is the day the Lord has made and I will rejoice. Amen? On the inside, I may be crying, but I'm going to force myself to remember that God is still on the throne and I'm going to rejoice for this is the day that the Lord has made. Amen? And so it's my behavior. I have to change my behavior. And what I want to talk to you today about is how do I change a behavior? How do I get in the spirit? How do I live in the spirit? And the key is this vision. And so let's go through this vision that he has just a little bit. Zechariah, I'm going to back up a little bit. Verse 1 and 2. The angel who talked with me returned and woke me up. Everybody say, wake up. You, I don't know about you, but when I sleep, I like to close my eyes. I know some people sleep with their eyes wide open, but I don't. I, I close my eyes. When you're asleep, you can't see nothing. You're not aware of anything. You're in the slumber. You're out. <sighs> right? That's how I sleep. And when I, when I sleep like that, it, then my eyes, uh, my eyes stay closed. My wife's eyes open. What's going on here? You got to wake up. If God is going to bring you to a new place, you got to see it first. And you can't see the vision as long as you're asleep. You have to find a way to open your eyes. You got to find a way to, to, to get right. Now, what had happened to the people of Israel is, is he, he's saying you, you are asleep. And throughout Scripture, we, we see God saying, wake up from your slumber, church. Wake up from your slumber, believer. Wake up from your slumber. And what he's talking about is not a physical sleep, but a spiritual sleep. 
And, and the people of Israel, they were still going through the motions. Before the temple fell, they were going through the motions. They were doing everything they needed to do. They were offering sacrifices. They were singing the songs. They were going to the temple. They were doing all that. But it was with their lips and not with their heart. And so they got away from God. And, and, and their relationship with God, their religious practice, it became nonchalant. Eh, what's the big deal? They were there. They were there. They just weren't in it. They were singing the songs, but they weren't really in it. It was something they had to do because all of their society was wrapped around. We fall asleep. We start getting away from church. We get away from God. We get away from our prayer time. We get away from our devotion time. And, and, and then when we do it, we're doing it, but we're not all the way in it. We're, we're kind of, well, you know, I know I should go, so I'm going to go. But we're not there because we want to be. We're not in the scripture because we want to be. We're doing it out of obligation. And, and little by little, we begin to fade away. And God is saying, wake up. You see... Hope comes from God. God is the God of hope. And so if you're not in God, if you're not in the presence of God, you will lose hope. And if you don't have any hope, you don't have any faith. If you don't have any faith, you have no vision. And the Bible says the people will perish for lack of vision. I've got to be able to see no matter where I'm at, no matter what valley I'm in, no matter how bad it seems, no matter how hard I'm hurting, no matter how good the enemy seems to be beating me up whatever it is how bad it is I've got to be able to see the victory I may not can feel it I may not can articulate it but somewhere I have to be able to see God is going to bring me through I know where I'm at but I know what God has promised me and I've got to be able to see it but I can't see it unless I become passionate about my God and when I become passionate about being in Christ and being in the Spirit, then His Spirit gives me hope. And then I can begin to come out of it. Amen? Now let's keep going. Verse 2, he asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it with seven channels to the lamps. And there were also two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl, one on its left, down to verse 11. It says, then I asked the angel, what are these two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? Again, I asked him, what are these two olive branches beside the two gold pipes that pour out gold and oil? He replied, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I said. So he said, these are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. Now let's dig into this a little bit. He said, the solid gold lampstand. Everybody say lampstand. Now, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, it says, Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw on my right hand and the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. When we see this vision of Zechariah, the lampstand is the church. Everybody say Church. The vision of the Spirit and the way I get into the Spirit and begin to live by the Spirit, the key is being in the church. You don't have to be engaged in the church to get to heaven. The Bible talks about people that are saved by the skin of their teeth. It is barely making They got just enough faith to get in. Some people say, well, he's not a Christian. All, all it takes to be a Christian is to have faith that Christ died on the cross for my sins and I'm forgiven. That's all it takes. Amen? When I receive him, my name's written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. I got a spot. I got a reservation. But if I want to live in the resurrection power, if I want to live on a higher dimension, if I want to have a wisdom that is above my own ability, if I want to have an anointing that is more than what I can do, if I want to have a God working through me in the people that I love and that I care about, if I want to see God do miracle after miracle, I have to have this resurrection power, and I cannot have it unless I'm engaged in the church. I've got to be engaged. Again, I can't be nonchalant. If I'm nonchalant, then I begin to fall asleep. So I got to wake up. I got to get involved in the church. And, and so now when you think of church, many times we think about this. This, this is church. We're gathered together. We, we're doing all that. But, but I would dare say there's some people in this room that don't know other people. There's some people in here that won't talk to anybody except you come in, you go out. Hey, how you doing? Right? 
And, and that's okay. There's no pressure. You don't have to talk to people. We're not going to tie you down or force you to talk to people. But you need a church. A church is somebody or, or is a group of people that you can call when you're in need. A group of people that you know no matter what time of the day, you can call them. They're going to answer the phone. They're going to pray for you. They're going to exhort you. They're going to encourage you. They're going to help you. They're going to give you some scriptures. They may tell you a joke, may give you a hug, whatever it is that you need. And, and they're going to help get you up out of the grave. The church, we spur one another. Sometimes the problems we have are with the people in our own house. Amen? Don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. So I need somebody outside of my own house that I can call upon when the problem's in my house. My wife needs other people she can call when I'm the problem. That's not very often. I'm just saying. I just want y'all to know. <laughs> we have to encourage one. This is what the church is about. This is why we come together. We help one another. Right Now, if I want to live in the Spirit, if I want to learn how to get in the Spirit so that I begin to act with love and patience and kindness and goodness, if I want to get into the Spirit, I have to engage in the church. I have to get myself into the church, not just where I sing, not just where I come to a particular place. I'm talking about a group of people who are believers that when you're going through a hard time, they're going to be there for you. They're not going to be there to give you some kind of epitaph. They're going to be there to give you scripture, to speak truth to you, to love on you, to encourage you, to pray for you, to help you in any way. And then when they're in trouble, you're going to be there for them. And that's how we do it. Amen. Now it says it was solid gold. Everybody say solid gold. Now to activate the law of the spirit, to activate this resurrection power, we must be pure. We must be pure. So many of us get upset with God when things don't go the way we want them to go. But in reality, I am impure. And I'm not fully engaged. And I, I, I want to be able to say to God, do everything that I ask. Give me all of your power, but don't ask me to be engaged. Don't ask me to let go of my sin. Don't ask me to let, you know, get rid of that kind of stuff. I want to be able to do what I want to do, and then you still do everything I want you to do. But I have to be pure. And now, the purity is happening in the church because the lampstand represents the church. Purity happens. We are, we are refined in the fire. Everybody say fire. That's where you get pure gold. You can have gold and it can have all kinds of, 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 of bad stuff in it. And, and, but when you want pure gold, it has to be refined by fire. And so what he's teaching us here is that when you go through the fire, when you go through the hard times, when you go through the problems, you are purified when you stay strong. You're purified when you say, I know what I feel like, I know what I see, but I still am going to praise God. I know everything is bad, but I'm still going to worship him. I know everybody else left me, but he never will. And it's this mentality that I'm going to fight through the depression, fight through the anger, fight through the bitterness, and keep worshiping my God, keep exalting him, keep living lifting him up, and I need you to help me do that when I'm in the fire. You see what I'm saying? I need you. That's why it happens in the church. Purity doesn't happen outside the church because when I'm outside the church, I can get lost in my sin. I can think about things. I can get lost in my depression. I can get mad at myself. Well, I didn't do this right, didn't do that right, and I fall into this stuff. But the Bible says it's better if somebody has somebody to help them when they fall down. It's better the two are better than one. Amen? And so when you fall down spiritually, you've got to have somebody that can say, it's all right. I know everything happened. Maybe it was your fault. Maybe you sinned. Maybe you did it. It doesn't matter. God's plan for your life didn't die with that thing. It is still alive and still well. All you got to do is get up and let's keep fighting through the fire. Amen? That's how we're purifying. That's why we need the church. The olive trees. This is where the anointing comes from. So I don't know if you can see this vision, but it's, it's, it's the traditional Jewish menorah. If you can think of the the candle with the, you know, the other lamps coming out. But in the vision, then there's a bowl, and then there's a, an olive tree on both sides. And so the oil, which is the anointing of the Spirit, is, is going into the bowl, then from the bowl to the lamps, and then it lights on fire. And so these olive tree, this is where the anointing comes from. This is the origin of it. So I want to talk to you for a minute about the Trinity. You have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is the Father's will that you would be resurrected 
up from the spirit of death. Amen? The father then sends his son and then sends the spirit. Jesus does the work. The spirit enables him to do that work. Are you with me? And so when we're talking about these two olive trees, now, uh, Zechariah understood this to, to maybe be Joshua and Zerubbabel. Joshua was a high priest, so there was the spiritual help. Zerubbabel was like Christ actually doing the work. You see, there are two parts of it. If I'm going to be purified, if I'm going to activate the law of the Spirit, then I have to both be in the Spirit. I have to get into Christ. I have to be spiritually minded, but then i got to go and do the work. I got to go and do the work. In, in the Old Testament, there was a time that the, the Israelites were upset. They're always upset, right? And what they do, they complain to Moses and, and said, Moses, Moses, save us, save us. So Moses goes to God, starts crying out to God, and God says, why are you crying out to me? Just lift up your staff. In other words, there's a time to stop praying. There's a time to stop singing. There's a time to stop gathering so we can go out and do the work of Christ. Amen. I like being here. I love, I love worship. I could sit and worship all day. I have the heart of a worship leader and the voice of a croaker, you know. But, but I love to be in worship. I love to be in the mountaintop experience. But what did Jesus tell Peter, James, and John? We got to go back. We got to go do the work. Amen. And so we have to be in the spirit. If I want to be purified, that's why I need the church. I have to be in the spirit. The fires of life keep me from serving people because the fires of life are trying to make me selfish, trying to get me focused on my problem, my issue, where I'm suffering, where's, what's going on in my life. And so I need the church to help remind me the way you fight through this is focus on other people. Focus on the Lord. Go and do the work. So everybody ought to be a preacher. Everybody ought to be a teacher. Everybody ought to be a prayer warrior. Everybody ought to feed the hungry. Everybody ought to go and help the homeless. Everybody ought to do what needs to be done in order to fulfill the mission of Christ. Amen? And as we do that together, we are purified. And as we are purified, the spirit works. And as the spirit works, hearts are changed. And as hearts are changed, God resurrects us from the dead. Amen? The bowl. Now, the bowl is unique because the bowl is not part of the traditional menorah. So this is only in the vision. And so you have the two olive trees that are pouring the oil into the bowl. So the bowl is part of the lampstand, but is at the head of the lampstand. The bowl here represents Christ, not Christ in heaven, but Christ incarnate, Christ in the flesh, Christ with us, the body of Christ, the head of Christ, the head of the body. And so this is talking about Christ being our head as the church, and he is gold just like we are gold. And so he's speaking of, of Christ incarnate, but he's filled with the spirit. And so that oil is filling him up, and then it is being poured out. If, if you want to be purified, and if you want to activate the law of the spirit so that God can elevate your life, you got to pour yourself out. Anything God gives you, you got to pour it out to somebody else. Now, here Christ pours himself out in the church. And a lot of times, especially in our day and age where, where this idea of compassion, this idea of good works has really uh, become very popularized, we think, well, we need to be going helping people outside the church. But here we see purification comes when I pour myself out into the church. When I pour myself out into my brothers and sisters of Christ. When I say, I, whatever I have learned, I want to share with you. Whatever God has taught me, I want to teach you. Wherever God has touched me, I want to touch you. Whatever miracles God has done for me, I want to do for you. And letting the Holy Spirit work through me. Because then when we do it in here, we all get built up. We all get built up. Too many Christians, we go to church and then we're focused on doing good deeds. And that's good. I don't want to discourage you from that. But if you don't pour yourself into the church, then the church is not built up. If the church is not built up then we are limited in what we're going to do. One of the reasons why people are not being taken care of and the church is not being the church as far as feeding people and taking care of people the way we should is because we don't pour into each other. We don't pour ourselves into each other, helping one another. And it starts in our house. It start, that's our first ministry is in our house, but in our church and pouring ourselves so that we build up one another so then we get stronger. And as we get stronger, we do more. We become more. And we are purified. Amen? 
Now, all of this is, is wrapped around the number seven. So there's seven lampstands, seven fires. The word seven goes back to the Sabbath day, the seventh day. The Sabbath was a day of rest. Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your soul. Not rest for your body, rest for your soul. Spiritual rest. The things that fatigue my spirit are fear and anxiety, insecurities. These fatigue me, wear me down. But when I come to Christ, I get spiritual rest. He builds me up and he eliminates my anxiety, my fear, my insecurities. I begin to see myself as he sees me and I begin to operate as he has called me to operate. And I begin to have a faith just like we saw in the testimony that even as I got the doctor's diagnosis, I was already at peace. Amen? The Sabbath day. It was a day of rest. It was a day of celebration. Remember, the Sabbath was also tied to the manna, and it was Passover, Passover right before the Sabbath. And so God said, on the sixth day, I will give you double what you need so that on the seventh day you can rest. When we really pour ourselves out into the church and we engage in the church as we need to be and take our spirituality serious, not nonchalantly, God begins to purify us, and he brings us to this place of spiritual rest. You hear me? And he's going to provide for us double what we need. He's going to take care of every need that you have. doesn't mean you're not going to have problems, but it means you're going to have power to overcome. You can have wisdom to overcome. You can have resources to overcome. Amen? And if he leaves you in the valley for just a little bit, it's just to teach you some things, to purify you, get in the church, let the church build you up. And through all of this, God is trying to elevate your life. If, if you don't get anything from these last few weeks, let God elevate your life. Have a vision for where he wants to take you, where he wants to take your marriage, where he wants to take your relationships, where he wants to take your spirit. Amen? Whatever it is, where he wants to take your peace, have a vision for it. And remember, he doesn't do it by might nor by power, but by his spirit in the church. And aren't you glad that we have a good church? Amen? Amen. I'm so glad for you. I'm thankful for you. I hope you're thankful for me, as bald as I am. But God is good, and we have friends. Think about the friends that you have that are not in this church, but they're in the universal church, your brothers and sisters in Christ, people that have been there for you at your lowest point. Amen? And you can look back, and you can see how the Spirit worked because somebody was there for you. Somebody spoke a word to you. Maybe somebody you didn't even know. You heard it on the radio. You heard it on Caleb. You heard it on a song. It may have been a preacher on TV. It may have been something here. But somehow the church has always been there for you. And I know there's stuff that happens in the church and people get their feelings hurt and churches split and there's scandalous and all that kind of stuff. But overall, the church is still where the Spirit of God is and it's been the people connected to the Spirit, the church, that have gotten us up out of the muck and mire and they have elevated our life. And we thank God for the church. Amen? Amen. Stand up with me. Let me pray for you this morning. Praise your name. Heavenly Father, help us to take our relationship with you serious. Lord, don't let us nonchalantly walk through life without ever living in the power of the resurrection. Teach us, Lord, that you have a desire that we would be elevated, not just for us, but for the other people in the tombs, for our children, our children's children, for our friends, our neighbors, even our enemies, Lord. And so, Lord, I pray that you would convict us, Lord, anywhere that we are not engaged, anywhere that we don't have people surrounding us on a, on a daily basis that we can call upon 
if, if we are not engaged where we can sit and talk and wrestle with issues and apply biblical principles, Lord, help us to find that place. Lord, thank you for our lifeline leaders here that are willingly sacrificing their time to provide that place. But Lord, we pray that as we engage in the church, that even in the fires, even in the trouble, you would use the church to help us. And Lord, may we be used to help others. And through it all, may we all be built up into your glorious household. Thank you for the church. Thank you for our brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a praise offering, amen.
Today is the welcome experience. It is going to be over there. Miss Sarah is going to open the overflow. If you signed up for that, I definitely want to encourage you to go. If you haven't attended the welcome experience yet and you're newer or new to Crossroads, I encourage you to go and check it out. It's very short. It's an awesome opportunity to learn a little bit about the church and the ministries and how you can get involved. Amen. If you're new here, we have a gift for you in the back. You can go grab that before you go to the welcome experience as well. You guys have a great day in the Lord. You're dismissed. May the Lord's favor shine upon you. Amen. And raise the house.